Hello class and welcome back. This is Mr. Biddle and today's digital input is entitled Four Empires. Previously we've explored the continuum of human history in the ancient Near East, from the first rudimentary settlements to advanced and highly populated cities. As we know, urbanization forced government leaders to expand their territories in order to sustain their way of life. This expansion would lead to the world's first empires. Therefore, today's lecture will focus on four notable Mesopotamian empires, how they rose to power, and the legacy they each left behind. Let's first start with a brief overview. To begin with, we'll explore the first empire ever established in the Near East, the Akkadian Empire. Then our class will examine the Babylonian Empire and how King Hammurabi used standardized law to unite his people. After which, we will study the Assyrian Empire, who mastered the science of warfare and engineering. And finally, we will discuss the habitually misunderstood Persian Empire and how the kings of Persepolis used wealth and religious tolerance to rule their diverse kingdom. So let's explore the first empire, the Akkadian Empire. Now, Akkad was located in the northern region of Mesopotamia. As you see on the map, this region was a bit more isolated, containing far less natural resources than the south. In truth, poor geography would undoubtedly create problems for the Akkadian people. At the time, Mesopotamia was essentially divided in two. In the north, there was Akkad, led by a man named Sargon. In the south was Sumer, led by a powerful high priest named Lugal, Lugal Zagizi. Yes, it's a mouthful. I think we need to rewind a little bit, though. Uh, who was Sargon, and how did he rise to power in the first place? The legend of Sargon's rise is pretty interesting. According to legend, baby Sargon was first discovered by a royal gardener in a basket floating along the Euphrates River. Now, after which, the gardener would raise Sargon in the palace as his own. Soon thereafter, he would be appointed the king's royal cup-bearer. Not too long after, the texts written by his daughter claim that Sargon was forced to kill the king in order to save his own life. Thus, Sargon took the throne of Akkad by force. A bit down the line, in 2300 BCE, Sargon decides to take his army south to defeat Lugal Zagizi and conquer all of Mesopotamia. As you probably guessed, Sargon would reign victorious creating the world's first empire. So now that Sargon is king of Mesopotamia, how do you suppose he governed? According to the Chronicle of Kings written by Babylonian historians, quote, Sargon had neither rival nor equal. His splendor over the lands it diffused. He brought it under one authority. He set up his statues there and ferried the West's booty across on barges. He stationed his court officials at intervals of five double hours and ruled in unity the tribes of the lands." End quote. In short, Sargon was an outstanding leader. First, he delegated power to those he could trust before his because his territory was so vast. And yes, sharing is caring. And by sharing responsibilities to loyal followers and family members, he could better control the trade routes that were importing and exporting cedar and bronze. He could also squash potential rebellions and collect tribute from all of his conquered territories. Indeed, Akkad would become very, very wealthy under Sargon's governance, and all Sargon would successfully rule his empire for 56 years before dying of old age. Now, uh, in regards to daily life, culture really flourished in Akkad. Specifically, there was an exchange of new ideas. See, Sumer shared their innovative irrigation techniques with Akkad, and conversely, Akkad would then share their art namely their writing, which you see here, and uh, over time, Akkadian cuneiform would replace Sumerian writing. So in regards to the culture, it kind of merged together. In regards to religion, both cultures would also remain polytheistic. Uh, consequently, uh, the Sumerian gods were named slightly different than the Akkadian gods, but like I said, over time, there was a confluence of ideas, and they kind of merged into one. The culture did flourish. They still remained devoutly polytheistic, um, however, Akkadian ideas sort of merged with Sumerian ideas. So what's the legacy of the Akkadian Empire and Sargon? Well, after Sargon's reign ended, he would pass on power to his sons, which was also something unique at the time. Unfortunately, his empire would become weaker and weaker, and his heirs could not control such a massive territory. 200 years later, Sargon's empire basically crumbled. Even though the Akkadian Empire was fairly short-lived, uh, they left an indelible mark on history. First, Akkad was the world's first century ruled empire. This would serve as a template for future governments on how to successfully rule a large territory. Second, Akkadian cuneiform would become the standard of writing for over 2,000 years. Standardized writing made language more accessible for everyone rather than just a privileged few. 
So let's talk about Babylon. So after the Akkadian Empire ended, Mesopotamia would spend uh, about 300 years in turmoil and all-out civil war between city-states. Eventually, one city-state located here on the map would rise to the top once more and unite all of Mesopotamia under one ruler, Babylon. Now, the story of how Babylon rose to power is quite similar to the Akkadian story. Uh, the founder of the Babylonian Empire was a man named Hammurabi. He was actually born a prince and would rise to become the sixth king of Babylon. Now, once in power, Hammurabi, of course, would wage war with several nearby city-states to, to expand his territory, and this expansion would eventually unite all of Mesopotamia under his sole governance. Now, similar to Sargon, Hammurabi knew that controlling such a vast territory would be difficult. Thus, he enhanced infrastructure, building a series of roads to help the flow of goods, information, and manpower. Building roads was one of the greatest ways to ensure your territory could be governed quickly and efficiently. Hammurabi also effectively governed by creating a new set of laws. These laws would become known as the Code of Hammurabi. Having a standard set of laws unified the people. Men, women, even slaves were all expected to act in a specific kind of way. By creating these laws and posting them throughout the empire, Hammurabi would instill order. And this was so important because, like I said, Mesopotamia spent the last 300 years in conflict. Now, even more, uh, Hammurabi told his people that Shamash, pictured here, the sun god, commanded him to write these laws, and because these laws were given to him through divine means, they could not be changed. They were literally set in stone. So even though these laws were not specifically religious in nature, they would indeed unite the people under a single polytheistic banner. Finally, the laws apply to all people. Slaves and women were now given more rights. They could even own property under the laws of Hammurabi. Not surprising, King Hammurabi of Babylon will become a very popular and beloved leader for all the ages. So Babylon's legacy is really impressive. First and foremost, the founding king, Hammurabi, was the first king to create a written set of laws for all of his citizens. Many of you have heard of the old saying, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Well, yep, that was one of Hammurabi's laws. You can even find a bas relief of Hammurabi in the U.S. House of Representatives, pictured here. Sadly, Babylon's time would be short-lived. After the death of Hammurabi, Mesopotamia would once again become fragmented and eventually fall into conflict once more. Speaking of conflict, let's talk about Assyria. So, as previously mentioned, the fall of Babylon forces Mesopotamia into utter chaos again. Small city-states city led by kings all trying to establish the next unified empire. Many would rise, many would fall, but one would become a dominant force once more, and that would be Assyria. So let's start with the geography. Now, like Akkad, Assyria is also located in northern Mesopotamia, and it was also quite isolated from other city-states. In truth, they also did not have the same access to natural resources that Babylon had. Indeed, Assyria's lack of resources really forced their leaders to conquer nearby city-states to really help feed their people. Who led the Assyrians to ultimate power? Well, that's kind of hard to say. Eventually, around 750 BCE, uh, a king by the name of Tiglath Pileser, who's pictured here, would finally conquer Babylon and unite all of the lands once more. So how did he do it? How did he rule uh, once he became the king of the entire empire of Assyria? Well, he ruled through military might. You see, Tiglath Pileser forced conquered people to join his infantry, creating one of the largest armies the world had ever seen. Assyrian rulers used their large military to ensure their forces could fight throughout the year, expanding borders and bringing in newfound wealth or tribute. Furthermore, Assyrians were the first people to create effective iron weapons, which were much more durable than bronze. Seriously, Assyrian, warring, Assyrian warriors were absolutely feared throughout the empire and beyond. Generals would also humiliate and torture their enemies in unspeakable ways. To top it off, Assyrians would chisel images of their cruelty on stone reliefs pictured here, and they would spread them throughout the empire as a form of terrorist propaganda. And by doing this, they thought that they could scare people into obedience. And quite honestly, it worked. Assyria's strict form of government would ensure that their empire would be successful for over 300 years. But what about daily life? What was it like for Assyrians who weren't in the military? Well, first, the Assyrians were master engineers. They were the first uh, to actually build aqueducts that could transport literally thousands of gallons of water into the cities from nearly 30 miles away. They were also innovative wall builders who utilized ramparts and crenellations that fortified the perimeters of their cities. 
Furthermore, kings in Assyria wielded tremendous power. Consequently, their palaces were larger than ever before. Their halls were adorned with massive statues and bas reliefs like this Lamassu pictured here, which would proclaim their power over all those who opposed them. In addition, Assyrians wanted to leave a lasting legacy, uh, and preserving their knowledge was extremely important to them. So they also created some of the world's first libraries. Yes, the library of Ashurbanipal would house thousands of clay tablets pictured here. You see Gilgamesh's story. And it would even inspire Alexander the Great to create his own library. To top it off, the Assyrians also uh, invented sie the siege engine. And like I said before, they invented iron-tipped weapons like the battering ram. They were absolutely innovative people. So what is their legacy? Well, as previously mentioned, Assyria would ensure their legacy by constructing libraries, aqueducts, iron weapons, and massive palaces with awe-inspiring sculptures. Conversely, Assyrian rulers were very oppressive and cruel to their enemies and their own people. Eventually, this would lead to all-out civil war, which weakened the centralized government, making Assyria's empire very susceptible to invasion from foreign powers, which is exactly what happened. Do you guys remember Babylon? Yeah. They would conquer the Assyrians once more and rule for a very short time, about 75 years. And in truth, this Neo-Babylonian Empire had very little time to establish themselves because another nearby empire from the east was knocking on their fortified gates. Yes, Persia. So, let's start with the geography of Persia. We conclude with one of the most powerful and rarely talked about empires in the ancient Near East. Located east of the Fertile Crescent, Persia began as really a group of independent city-states and nomadic tribes. Like Mesopotamia, a single, all-powerful leader would unite Persia and create one of the largest empires the world had ever known, an empire that spanned from India to Egypt. Who was responsible for creating such a vast empire? A man named Cyrus the Great. The story of Cyrus is similar to many great kings. He was also born a prince and would eventually become king of his city-state. Soon thereafter, Cyrus would begin a military campaign to expand and unite his territories through conquest and diplomacy. Nearly all of his battles were decisive. At times, many leaders would simply surrender because they knew that Cyrus was a fair and just leader. It wasn't long before the Persian Empire would become the, the largest empire the world had ever seen at the time. Before the death of Cyrus, his style of leadership was praised far and wide. First, he set up autonomous states called satrapies that helped him to oversee his massive territory. By delegating authority to these large states or satrapies, he was able to govern his entire empire from Persia. For over 200 years, Persian kings that followed were able to communicate with the leaders of these satrapies using an expansive network of roads. This important piece of infrastructure would be known as the Royal Road, and it would be used to import and export goods, collect tribute, and send uh, troops to help police Persian territories. Even more, the Royal Roads allowed Persian kings to collect tribute from their conquered territories, and this tribute would help to give Persia tremendous wealth and power in the ancient world. Second, Cyrus was a benevolent leader. After conquering Babylon, he released over 40,000 Jewish slaves. You see, the Persians believed that slavery was inhumane. Furthermore, Cyrus believed that people should be free to worship as they please. And at the time, that was revolutionary. So how do we know this? Well, uh, Cyrus created the world's first human rights doctrine known as the Cylinder Seal of Cyrus, pictured here. And this proclaimed that people have the right to worship as they please. So let's talk about daily life. Indeed, Persia would usher in peace and prosperity to the ancient Near East. So prosperous, in fact, that they didn't require slave labor to help build their new uh, capital city of Persepolis. Persians, Persians actually paid their workers. As a result, the Apadana Palace, which you see pictured here, in the heart of Persepolis, was a sight to behold. The hallway alone was over 200 feet long. The interior was lined with cedar and bronze and gold. Impressive, to say the least. Speaking of gold, Persia began using a standardized system of money, creating gold coins known as derricks. Standardized money would play a major role in sustaining wealth because it simplified trade. These gold coins would actually help Persia's economy flourish. Persians would even create holidays that honored their wealth and prosperity. Every spring, the people would celebrate, orchestrating large festivals throughout the city. This holiday, called Nowruz, is often called the Persian New Year, and it's actually still celebrated today by Persians and Iranians worldwide. So, were the ancient Persians religious themselves? Well, yes, they were. 
except they weren't polytheistic, they were monotheistic, meaning they believed in one God. Persian faith, known as Zoroastrianism, prohibited slavery, believed that working hard led to a happy life, and that all people possessed free will, which explains why Persian kings never forced people in their empire to worship a certain way. In all, Persia would remain a superpower for almost 200 years. Consequently, a very famous conqueror by the name of Alexander the Great would defeat the Persians and burn down the city of Persepolis. Sadly, the tomb of Cyrus was also ransacked and looted, yet when Alexander discovered this, he punished the men who damaged the tomb and restored it to its original state. Indeed, Alexander knew that Cyrus was a man who embodied intelligence, bravery, and benevolence. Perhaps this is why Alexander chose not to desecrate his burial site. To this day, the tomb of Cyrus, pictured here, still remains untouched, a lasting monument to the Persian Empire. So let's review. First, we examined the rise of the first empire in the Near East, the Akkadian Empire. We learned that the founder of Sargon built roads and delegated authority to trusted friends and families to help rule his empire. Then we learned about the Babylonian Empire, founded by King Hammurabi. We discussed how Hammurabi created a standardized set of laws that not only protected his people, but united them under a shared system of rules. Next, we explored the Assyrian Empire. Their mighty kings enhanced their infrastructure, building walls and aqueducts, while simultaneously strengthening their military by forcing their prisoners of war into service. And finally, we studied the Persian Empire, founded by Cyrus the Great. Persian kings were, were required that all conquered people were required to also pay tribute, which would give their empire tremendous wealth. In exchange, Persia let these same conquered people worship as they pleased. So there you have it, four great empires, all led by powerful kings. Each and every king chose to govern his people in a, in, in a unique way. And yet, they all wanted the same thing, to protect and preserve their way of life. Remember, class, this is just one chapter of the most amazing story ever told, your story.